Last time I started with a story, but this time I'm going to finish with a story, so just get straight into the message. <clears throat> Go with the good news. That's the uh, series which is being done at the moment, and uh, think of a verse like Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, and I was thinking, you've just heard from Tim, who uh, has talked about going, and now we're back onto the gospel itself, and uh, the good news, and that's what we're focusing on. Hans said last week that, yeah, what do we take? What's the message that we take? And, and we need to focus and have a real clarity on that. And knowing the good news is not just something we learn, not just something we understand with our minds, but it's, it's crucially something that is written on our hearts that we really grasp with, with our whole being. Jeremiah 31 says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And one of the things that happens in our Christian life is we can, we can know a lot. But it's another thing to really hold it deep in our hearts. And when the pressure comes on, sometimes what we know in our minds can become pretty weak. Um, when the pressure's on, some of the psalmists declare, has, you know, they say to God, has your unfailing love finished for all time? Now, that's a complete contradiction of doctrine and truth because when the pressure was on, they were really challenged how much they really hold on to the truth. Today, we're going to focus on two more precious aspects of the good news. The truths God wants us to understand clearly, but also to be written on our hearts. And the first is reconciliation. Romans 5, verse 8 to 10. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And this is the situation. We're all sinners. And that's bad enough, but more it says that all of us were enemies of God. And I know some people might think enemy of God, that's not really how... I would describe particularly people perhaps who are, became Christians when they're very young, but the Bible is very clear with all of us. There is this deep entrenched hostility to God. And I remember sharing when I was working at New Zealand Steel, particularly there was some people there who were very, you know, they were quite friendly and nice and I got on with them well. But when you started touching on areas of truth, boy, you, sometimes you unearthed a, a volcano. I remember one time I was down at the, um, in the area of one of the laboratories where, uh, you know, there's some guys who are pretty, pretty highly qualified doctors in, in their areas of science. And I started, I thought, well, here's a good opportunity to share with someone. I was working on a computer there and, and uh, I was, started talking to this guy and started sharing a few things and, and started to kind of share a bit of the gospel with him. And next moment, he just exploded. And, and I, I remember thinking, right. And I sort of kind of worked my way out of the situation. He slowly settled, settled down. But the amazing, the hostility in the human heart to the good news. And the Bible says we're all enemies, hostile to God, not wanting God, honestly hating him not wanting him to rule in our lives. But God loved us in this very condition of sin and enmity. God didn't get his back up towards us, even though we had our back up towards him. He loved us. His desire, his yearning, his longing for reconciliation with us was so great that he initiated the process of reconciliation. But 
but for him as a holy God that was very costly. I mean, sin, sin is a really terrible thing in God's sight. He, he can't tolerate it. it. It must be punished. So the only way for reconciliation to take place was for him to pay the full cost, the full punishment for our sin through the substitute of his own son. And so as it says here in the passage, Christ died. Jesus shed his blood and he did this because it was the only way in which our sin and our enmity to God could be paid for. Just in Isaiah 53, a passage I read a couple of weeks ago, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, this reveals the lengths to which God is, is going to go to, is willing to go to, to be reconciled with us. And the thing about reconciliation is it takes two parties. God is willing. God is always willing to be reconciled with us. But are we willing to be reconciled with him? And for that to happen, the thing that divides us from God has to be faced up to. Our sin, we have to face up to it. Our, our hostility to be, towards God, we have to face up to. We have to own up to it without excuse. Yes, I'm a sinner. And, and we must turn from it and receive full forgiveness. You know, you can you know the picture. Perhaps it's perhaps it's a hard one, but you get two people who are who are hostile to each other, and one is willing to forgive, and the other will sort of kind of say, "Yeah, okay, on my terms," but that won't that won't bridge the gap. For instance, if a husband who's been is willing to forgive him, but he doesn't, is not willing to leave his unfaithfulness behind. There, there can't be reconciliation. To receive his full forgiveness, we must turn from our sin and receive his full and total forgiveness. Only then can we be reconciled to the Father, the great lover of our soul. Now, the thing about this passage which really strikes me is it's, that's an amazing thing. It's, it's kind of, for us, you know, when you've been around a long time, the, the gospel message can, can sometimes become so familiar that it doesn't kind of cause that, that initial, like when I was first saved, I remember the sense of joy. God, God you've, done, you've done what I've longed for. You've saved me because I felt so... You know, with so many people, they feel they can't believe, they can't, and yet, when I was saved, there was such a sense of joy, and I remember kneeling by the bed of the place where I was staying that night and saying, God, thank you, but I feel like my thanks are just doesn't measure up to what I sense you've done for me, and that joy of being reconciled with God, but look what happens next the powerful hand of God that comes upon our lives once we are reconciled to him. If God in his great love for you and me paid such an awesome cost to reconcile us, and it goes on in this passage, how much more will he finish and complete the task? transforming us from enemies into the very likeness of his son. His power is at work in us to fulfill what we cannot by our own human effort and human willpower. 
it's, it's a, I, I highly treasure and, and realize the importance of our choices. God, we need to choose, but there is a sense, and the Bible brings out so clearly that we, we cannot do it on our own. We don't have the sufficient resources. We don't have the capacity to obey him and even to desire him as he will. So his powerful hand, his Holy Spirit, working in us to actually create within us the very things that we cannot create in ourselves. It's so, this is his great work. His grip on your life once you have reconciled to him, is so powerful, far greater than you or I will ever understand in this life. You may not feel it. You may not sense it. Sometimes God can seem far away, and yet even at that time, he has a grip on your life that you wouldn't believe. I remember someone once described um, a Christian he said, if you look back on your life, it's a bit like a sheep. Have you ever seen uh, a sheep when you're trying to move it and, and, and they're really, you know, you might even have a, a rope on it to try and pull it and it's totally resistant. So it puts its feet out like this and just digs in and, and it's really hard to get it to move and it sort of almost creates ruts in the ground. I remember one person saying, when we get to heaven, we're going to see all the ruts all the way. To, to the, as God has had to pull us and haul us to heaven. His grip on your life is powerful, incredibly powerful. You know, we sing songs like, uh, there's one Jesus, lover of my soul, I will never let you go. And I always change the words when I sing it. Jesus, lover of my soul, you will never let me go. You will never let me go. We've just read of the cost. And uh, come back again. We've re just realized the cost of the Father's love and Christ dying for us. That is the immense love that he has. And his whole will and desire and power is to fulfill in our lives what Jesus died for. Just... Just a little sneak preview of our necessary response. Um, I know we're talking about the gospel, but I just, the actual gospel itself, but I just thought I would just give a little teaser to the future. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone the new has come. That's a wonderful truth. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us that God was re reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So you have been reconciled to God, but God then wants you to be his ambassador, representative, Speaking on his behalf, your very words are the words of God to others. It's an amazing thing. Reconciled. Next, adoption. You know, I, I thought about this, this word adoption and what I'm going to share, and, and, and our hearts can resist even be closed to some truths because like I said in our it's one thing in our minds but in our hearts there can be quite a resistance to some truths and it can be because of our past there might have been painful human experience possibly nothing else can cut as deep 
and scar us as much as failure or abandonment or harsh treatment by a mother or sadly, much more likely a father. And there may be people today who, who have that. And, and when we come to this next step, it's kind of like, ah, oh, father. But this truth is about God. Our father who will never fail us. J.I. Packer made this comment, our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption, of all the gifts of grace, adoption is the highest. And someone else said, God's grace goes far beyond forgiveness, and adoption is, epitomizes the highest that God has done for us. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Adoption was not part of Jewish law. They had no adoption in their, in their system. But adoption was a very strongly established part of Roman law. And a slave, through a process called manumission, normally by the owner, could be granted freedom and be called a freed man. Okay, and that was called manumission. Um, emancipation is done by by a country or by a large group of people, it's effectively manumission is done by an individual, setting a slave free, and they became a freed man. Is that what Jesus did for us? No, far, far more. Yes, he brought us out of slavery, but through adoption, Adoption to sonship through redemption, through being reconciled to him, we have received adoption. And adoption meant that a man was raised to the full and the same status as the one who adopted him. Not, not to a lesser status, but to the same status. And he became an heir. And so we have the example of, for instance, you've all, most of you will have heard of Julius Caesar. Um, and he adopted Augustus. And Augustus became Caesar Augustus, and he was effectively the first emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was the one who was alive at the time of Christ's birth. Raised to the full status, and to be, Augustus became the heir of Julius Caesar. In fact, he took, he took over the whole Roman Empire, raised to the same status. And that is what the Father has done for us who are reconciled to him. No longer a slave, no longer just a freed man, but a son. And, and look how the Spirit puts in our hearts the cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. That's the same cry that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane when he poured out his heart to his Father. It's a word that expresses an intimate relationship. Dad. You know, I've, I've heard some people have talked about the fact that it's daddy, but everything I've read really highlights a mature relationship of a son with his father. You know, just as we were worshipping before, I was kind of quite touched because we, we sang in the song, 
hymn of heaven talked about all the, the cries that we have in our heart. And, and I vividly saw, thought of a time when I was, I was, I needed a job and I needed a job urgently um, or I was going to go into debt. And because I had a wife and three kids, I was in a fair bit of desperation. And, uh, and I prayed. And I felt like a cloud would come down on me, dark cloud, and I'd pray and it'd sort of lift and I'd pray and it would lift. And, and, and uh, I wept and I cried. I remember one time hearing my little... Oh, time for a decent mic. <laughs> okay. Right. And I heard my uh, son running out saying, Mummy, Mummy, Daddy's crying, Daddy's crying. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a... I remember that, hearing that voice, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy's crying. And it was quite precious. And, and I didn't realize I was crying so loud because the door was shut, but <laughs> he could hear me. And uh, two and a half year old, probably it's pretty, pretty concerning to hear your daddy crying. But I treasure the word dad a lot more. Three people on this earth call me dad. I love that word. One of my sons in a couple of years' time is going to be 50. Just to let you know my age. In fact, I've got my grandson here this morning. <laughs> um, but when, when my son says, Dad, Dad, it does something in here. It's a word that expresses an intimate relationship with God. Abba. Dad. I can call my Father in heaven, Dad. You can call your Father in heaven, Dad. With all the rich meaning of what Dad, far beyond actually even your own relationship, however good your relationship with your earthly father has been, he is more, your heavenly father is more your dad than your earthly father can ever be. And this is not the only way our relationship with father is compared with Jesus. Jesus said, Dad, we can say Dad, or Abba, we say Abba. We are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. That's an amazing statement. It says heirs here in Galatians, but in the parallel passage in Romans 8, it says we are co-heirs with Christ. And, and although we will never be divine, there is, even though God raises us to the status of sonship, and we, but we will never be divine, Jesus is not ashamed, it says, to call us brothers. And, and note, in Ephesians 1 verse 20, and this is quite a, uh, this is a hard one to grasp, and I realize even as I was coming to preach today, how can I express the, the amazing thing that God has done? God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. That's powerful, that's, but that's Christ. Oh, of course, seated at the right hand of his father in the heavenly realms. There was a, a very godly woman uh, who was who used to, uh, was highly looked up to by many. And she had some interesting phrases. Uh, one time she was leaving by, by train from a station in London and, uh, and there were a whole lot of, you know, conservative Anglican ministers there who she'd been speaking to and sharing with and and she yelled out the window window nestle don't wrestle <laughs> and all these guys were rather embarrassed <laughs> but she was one who came out with these phrases well she had another one and her phrase was look down look down not not look up 
your redemption draws nigh, but look down. And the reason she said so is because of this next verse. Ephesians 2 verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Past tense. When you were saved, you were raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms. Now, that's hard to comprehend because you're sitting down here, but in position, in status, in acceptance and full relationship with God the Father, you are now seated in heavenly places with Jesus. And I mean, that's to us, just how do we grasp that? But that's the reality. One further comparison between ours and Jesus' relationship with his Father is his prayer in the garden, which says, not what I will, but what you will, expresses this comparison. As a son, he was in reverent submission to his Father. So there's, there's Jesus, Abba Father, not my will, but your will. There's Jesus in reverent submission to his Father. Submission can be seen as a hard word to some. Submission was the reason which I rejected being a Christian for so many years. And as soon as I became a Christian, I knew that submission was necessary and right from the beginning. But it's not submission as a slave. And I think so many people have a concept of submission to the will of God as being like, you know, like a a slave. But it's not. It's submission as a son. God is actually preparing us to reign with him. Just, we can't grasp. No, no emperor in this world, no ruler in this world has ever experienced what we will experience when we reign with God. We, we submit to God because to the Father because we realize he alone knows what is best for us. He actually knows what is best for us. We actually don't even know ourselves what is best for us, but he does. And and when we grasp how much he loves us and how much he knows what is best for us and he wants what is best for us, you know... God always desires the best for your life, more than you do. Because he loves you more than anyone else has ever loved you and ever will. There is no love that compares with the love of the Father for you right now. He loves you with an incredible depth. Just a a quick thought, because I keep talking about sons, and yes, the Roman picture of adoption was a very powerful one, seeing a person raised, and they were from from being slaves to being freed men, and from being freed men to being sons. That actually happened in in Roman history. But it was always to do with a male. Because that's that was their culture. And that was the that was the picture that Paul was able to draw on for adoption. But that's why we do not lean our interpretation of the Bible only on the culture of the day and the belief of the day and draw from that because the Bible goes far beyond that and clearly lays out the fact that there is neither male nor female in Christ. And we have this beautiful verse in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18. I will be a father to you 
and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This truth of adoption, being raised to the full status of sonship and daughtership in Christ. Well, I'm going to close with a story. Now, I can't, I would have liked to have read the whole story to you, but I can't, it's too long. But it's, it's a story that's moved me very deeply, and I, I trust I'll be able to share it with you without the emotion that sometimes I feel when I, when I read it. But it's, it's called The Orphan. And it's, uh, if you want to read the full story, and I, uh, I recommend you to, it's from chapter two of Case for Grace by Lee Strobel. Now this girl, Stephanie, never knew her father. She was an illegitimate child, probably to an American soldier during the Korean conflict during the early 50s. So she was a half-caste. She used, said the term stooji was used, a term of derision in those days. Just not accepted to be a half-caste. And when she was four, her mother married. But the man did not want her to be a part of the family. And so her mum faced this tremendous dilemma and... In her great distress, she sent her four-year-old daughter on the train. She took her onto the train. She had a, just wrapped up in a scarf, some food and some spare clothes, and sent her off on the train to her uncle. The problem was when she reached the destination, there was no one there. She waited all day and then well, till the evening and the station master uh, called her a stoogie and sent her off. Now, it's hard to credit that, but it was a different day. I mean, it was the whole time of the, the career in those days with the, with the wars and all that had happened. It was, there was a lot of upheaval. I didn't realise, but World Vision actually started in Korea to help the, the kids the waifs and the strays. And uh, she said that even at four, there was a certain level of independence that we don't grasp with four years today because of the way they were brought up and how often they were left on their own, even at that age. But she lived in the streets. And, and you know, when you read the story, it's just horrific, the abuse she faced. It's hard to, yeah, four-year-old. The sickness, the filth. At seven, she was picked up on the streets of Darjin by a World Vision worker and uh, taken into the orphanage where she helped out on the baby's ward. And, uh, you know... She, she loved that because she had some, these little kids responded to her and she'd never experienced that kind of thing. But every now and then one of the children would disappear from the baby's ward because they, they were being adopted. And she kind of was quite, uh, you know, what's going on? She had no understanding of adoption whatsoever. She couldn't grasp it. She was only seven and she hadn't experienced much of well, very almost nothing of family life or parenthood, parents. One day, a missionary couple came to adopt a baby boy, and uh, she would always be aware that this was happening, and she sort of spruced up all the babies in the morning and kind of, uh, you know, sort of interested. And, and uh, they came in and looked around, and then they looked at her, now, they were coming to adopt a baby boy, and they looked at her, and, and their hearts were touched. I mean, she was still physically quite, she had a glazy eye, I think, and she was kind of a bit of a, still, still bearing the scars of her street life, and she was 
from her perspective, she was nothing to look at, nothing to be wanted. But they looked at her and, and they, something in them responded. And they said, that's the one. And uh, they went up to her and the husband touched her and touched her head, but she, she just reacted. Even though she kind of, in one part of her, responded to being touched on her head, and, but something just reacted and she chucked his hand off and spat on him twice and ran away. And uh, the next day, they came, the couple were there again. She saw them and she thought, oh, no, I'm in big trouble. I'm going to be beaten up. I mean, she knew what it was to be beaten up. But she just uh, found out that they were committed to adopting her. She had no understanding. She actually, from her, what the little she'd seen, she thought she was going to become a slave of this couple. That's what she thought that meant. So I'll just read this bit because it expresses it so well. These guys had expected to adopt a boy and name him Stephen, so they gave their new little girl the name Stephanie. The house in Korea, modest by Western standards, seems huge to her. I'd never seen a refrigerator, a flush toilet, or a bed before. I thought, well, this will be a fun place to work. They even had eggs, which only affluent Koreans could afford. They cleansed me up, cleaned me up, gave me antibiotics, and got me healthy. They kept feeding me, tucking me into bed, buying me new clothes, but never putting me to work. And Lee Strobel asked the question, did that confuse you? Yes, I wondered why for several months, but I was afraid to bring it up to them. We'd go into a village and everybody would treat me like I was something wonderful. I couldn't understand. I'd been a 2G, but now I was being treated like a princess. Then one day a girl said to me, you smell American. What do you mean? She said, you smell like cheese. Korean children always said foreigners smelled like cheese. Now, I don't know if that's so today. I said, no, I'm not an American, but those Americans are really funny. They haven't put me to work yet. They're really treating me nice. She looked at me with a surprised expression and said, Stephanie, don't you realize that you're their daughter? The idea had never occurred to me. I said, no, I'm not their daughter. And she said, yes, you are. You are their daughter. I was astonished. I turned and ran out of the room and up the hill toward my house, thinking to myself, I'm their daughter. I'm their daughter. I'm their daughter. Oh, that's why I've been treated this way. That's why, that's why no one's beating me. That's why nobody's calling me a 2G. I'm their daughter. I ran into the house to my mum who was sitting in a chair and I declared in Korean, I'm your daughter. She didn't speak Korean yet, but a worker said to my mum, she's saying she's your daughter. With that, big tears began to run down my mummy's face. She nodded and said to me, yes, Stephanie, you're my daughter. You know, he asked her, how did that make you feel? And, and she, she kind of paused for a minute and said, there's no words, no words. There is in our hearts a deep, a deep cry to have that kind of relationship with our Father. The problem is we can be like her. Now she later became a Christian. It was a, quite a, a story, but she became a lovely woman of God. But... We can be like her, we just don't understand. We can think we're just servants, we're just like this, we're just two Gs or half castes, or we don't see our worth to God. But if God is your father, you are his daughter, you are his son. 
and you can call him dad.